Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks everyone for coming. It's great to uh, welcome you back to our last, uh, ser- last uh, speaker of the series. So it's a bittersweet that we're all here together uh, today. I want to welcome our outside simulcast viewers, particularly uh, our, our old standbys from University of Manitoba, uh, University of Calgary, and our tape-delayed uh, viewers at the Littman Institute in, in Luxembourg. I want to also thank, as always, Howard Weider and the Global Institute for Water Security for underwriting this uh, series. And, uh, and in the spirit of saving the best to last, it's so wonderful to, to uh, welcome Siva, Siva Palin. Uh, Siva is at University of Illinois, and he has a dual appointment, half in geography and the half in civil engineering. And as you'll see in his work today, his, his work is really cutting across uh, several boundaries. Siva came to Illinois about eight years ago, uh, following an 18-year stint at the University of Western Australia in Perth, where he was a, a professor there. And before that, a PhD at Princeton. He's, he's done work uh, internationally uh, in that intervening period as well. But Siva has really made some deep contributions to our field. Uh, in terms of scaling, Siva and some of his colleagues have really kind of defined uh, scaling relations in the hydrological sciences. Uh, Siva single-handedly led the International Decade on Prediction on Gauge Basins, an IAHS uh, initiative. Siva was the, uh, the first chair of the pub decade, and now really pushing this new field of socio-hydrology forward that you're going to hear about this afternoon. And I, uh, for this, Siva is probably the most decorated hydrologist working today. He's a fellow of the AGU, fellow of the International Water Academy, and fellow of the Modeling and Simulation Society of Australia and New Zealand. He's recipient of the International Hydrology Prize from the IHS, this International Hydro, uh, Association of Hydrological Sciences. He's a Dalton medalist, and he's recipient of the Horton Medal, the highest honor that AGU bestows upon uh, hydrologists. But you know, even more than all this, I think what really speaks to Siva's impact and uh, and uh, you know deep commitment to the field is his work with Pub, with uh, IHS and even being uh, the executive ed- editor of HESS, the Hydrology and Earth System Science Journal of EGU. So it's with this we uh, really welcome Siva to us to uh, hear about some new thoughts he has on the area of sociohydrology. Siva. Thank you, Jim. Okay, thank you, Jeff, for uh, that introduction. Um, I think uh, <clears throat> the starting point is I, I'm really glad to be here in Saskatchewan and Saskatoon. Um, you know, so I, I'm here. It seems like what I'm from what I'm hearing and, and reading Saskatchewan with the institute that you guys have set up is the, is the place to be. It's almost like the center of the world when it comes to border research, and so I'm glad that I'm here, because if I had missed that opportunity later, I will regret it. So I'm really glad, and thank you, Jeff, for inviting me to this, and uh, thanks, Howard, for supporting this uh, thing of initiative of uh, Jeff. I'm really delighted to be here, and it uh, gives me another opportunity to, you know, every time I give this kind of talk, you know, hydrology, is something that I, I, every time I give this, I learn from it, because it's you know, unless I, I talk to someone, it's very hard to clarify my own ideas, and this is one rare opportunity that I have to do that. Um, I'm just looking back, uh, uh, Jeff mentioned pub, and I, um, looking back to about 1997, when um, I was a bit at a low point of my career, because I was really getting very disillusioned with what I was doing. Not because I was not doing anything great, but I was doing good work, publishing well and so on, but I felt that it was not really relevant. You know, just you know, some, a few papers here and there, what is it useful for? And I think that, that it was at that time somebody introduced me to this pub idea, and that was a big change in my perception and really gave me a lot of energy to continue. And, uh, and so um, pub decade finished, and I think I, I again went through this kind of thing that, oh, I'm, I'm not doing things that are really important, especially when it comes to water. And so the, the focus on social hydrology is kind of an, a, a came out of that sort of feeling of disillusionment that I had to do it. And the other thing that I just want to mention, again, I remember 
when I started pub uh, back in 2009, I remember going to Europe on a sabbatical. And uh, in, before pub started, by the way, that was before pub, even pub was introduced. I gave the same talk. I uh, prepared a talk on predictions in ungauge basins back in Australia. I gave the talk in Perth and then went, went ahead, went to India, went to Europe, and gave something like 12 talks in 12 different places around Europe. It's almost like a traveling salesman. Or, or, or you can call it me a missionary. And, and I, I, I even went to Imperial College in 2000 when I gave this talk. And uh, it was all, it's only at the end of that that then I introduced the same idea to IHS and they picked up on it. So even in the context of social ideology, I'm again in that missionary um, kind of state that you know, I'm going around uh, sort of trying to sort of um, uh, get people interested in this sort of area and that way grow the field. So I'm back to the same thing and uh, so that's where I am. And so today I'm going to talk a little bit about social hydrologic modeling um, that we have been trying to do. Again, as a way, the modeling that I'm going to present to you, be, be careful, be aware that it's, it's almost like using the modeling as a way to clarify our minds. That's basically what I'm presenting. I think some, some of you who are here in the audience will be horrified but I, what I'm going to present in, ter, in, the, in the name of social hydrology and in the name of social hydrologic modeling. Uh, you will wait and see. So I think that this is just a way of um, clarifying our thoughts, communicating with other people, and see that I can gain something back from that conversation, because this is exactly what I did 10 years ago in, in the context of pub. So I, um, I have to acknowledge uh, a number of the people who have con uh, contributed, in fact, the, two, the top two people are two master students. One visited me from TU Delft and developed the model that I'm going to present to you. And then he left. And then I have a master student who is who's continuing with that work. And so uh, I don't have any funded project. I don't have any funded students. These are people that I, I gather from the street and get them to do something so that I can keep moving. Otherwise, you are still staying still. And, and then a number of other co colleagues have been helping me with this. So. Last year, we published a co commentary in Journal of uh, Hydrological Processes, where we introduced the idea of social hydrology, a new science of people and water. And um, I, I know some of you have read this paper as part of the class that Jeff teaches. But I just want to um, say that yeah, um, we used this river basin in, in Australia, Marambiji, as an example, as, as a way of you know, bringing the, the ideas cl clearer. So, because I had visited Marambi uh, Mar in Sydney the year before and talked to a lot of people there, I was fascinated by the dynamics that were describing to me. I thought that that is the way that I'm going to use, uh, that is the story I'm going to use to sort of communicate social ideology and why it's important. And, um, and then, um, building on that, uh, this year, I got my colleagues in Australia to help me to write this uh, paper, which actually had, had more details to what we presented in the original paper. We didn't have enough details. There was a commentary. And these people actually have gathered all the data and, and put together a really nice story about what's going on in, in the Marambiji and why, in, the, in that context, social hydrology is uh, a fantastic way of capturing the, the, the dynamics that is going on. So I think that uh, I don't know that I really have to introduce Mar Mare Darling River Basin. Mare Darling is an iconic river basin, not just in Australia, but the whole world. It's, it's an important, large basin that is in the eastern, United, eastern Australia. And uh, so a lot of controversy, a lot of um, discussion has been going on um, over the last 10 years. There was a major drought that happened, and that focused people's attention on, on how to manage the water in this basin, but we are focusing on a part of that large basin called the Marambiji here. And uh, so you can see some details about the Marambiji. It's about 7.5% of the entire basin. There are about half a million people. And uh, it's um, considered as Southeast of Australia's football. It, it produces a lot of the food. I, ha I can give you more statistics on it, and ag agricultural production is worth Australian dollars 1.9 billion. It's just substantial, including rice production and so on. And uh, a little bit more details of the Marambiji. Mar 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 
uh, I think you should know that you know, in Australia, the rivers here flow this way, from east to west, and, and then eventually go down, all the way down to uh, the Southern Ocean. And uh, so there are a, a couple of dams here, and then they control the water, and then the water flows down this way. And over time, there has been a lot of irrigation activity that has happened here. And in fact, what happened was that a long time ago, about 100 years ago, people started from here. They started in the downstream, settled in the downstream, and then gradually kept on moving upstream. Um, and, and, and they moved further and further upstream as more and more hydraulic structures were built to harvest the water and create irrigation schemes. So the, they followed the water, almost. So the dams were built, and then the people followed it. And they, so people started migrating up, up further up. And uh, you can see some of the major irrigation areas here, seen here. So these were all constructed over time, over the last 100 years. And I'm going to, we are going to focus today in my talk just starting at Wagga Wagga. It's a major, another name that you should remember. Wagga Wagga is a famous name. Wagga and Gundagai. I've actually modeled the, the flow of flood routing from Gundagai to Wagga Wagga. I like the names. Um, so, so we are going to start from here. So the, 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 the modeling that we are going to do is use, using the flows that are coming in as the upstream input, and then how it, the water is being used in the rest of the river basin. Okay. Now, in this paper that we recently published, there's, there's some really interesting data. There are two slides here. The, my colleagues have divided the last 100 years into four so-called eras. And, uh, and unfortunately, the, the quality of the pictures, uh, the, the printing is not very clear. But you, you, you know, this, this is, for example, the, the, the dams that were built over time. So starting in 1910, there was nothing, and then gradually, more and more dams were being built up to the, uh, up to the end of 1970s. And that, that was the end. No more dams after that. And then this here is a picture of the, amount, the area under irrigation. So, uh, so people followed the water. Irrigation followed the water. And so you can see a huge in increase in the irrigated area. And eventually it stabilized. And we're going to talk about this later. But if, some point in time in the 1990s, it, started, it all started crashing down, it came down. So we, I call that a pendulum swing. So it went, kept on going, and then eventually turned around. And here you have the, the population size. So people, there were hardly about 5,000 people at the beginning of the century, and they kept on growing. People were migrating in from outside and, and migra migrating upwards in the, in the river basin. And again, the same period that this all happened, the population started decreasing. People are leaving. People are migrating out. And uh, so that's the dynamics. And then you have the um, rice production. This is uh, the, the uh, production of rice that happened in this river basin. No, and, and more pictures. Uh, the amount of water used for irrigation. So of course, as you can see, the, the dams, the amount of water they use come from the dam and the irrigation area. They kept on going. And this here is a picture of the water that is left in the river. So in other words, environmental flows. So as people started taking more and more water out of the, out of the river, there's less and less flowing downstream. And in fact, the, right, the situation now is that the entire Murray Darling River Basin, in the end, doesn't deliver even a single drop of water to the Southern, Southern Ocean. The flow comes to a complete stop, just like in the Colorado. No more flow. And, and that creates a lot of, uh, a lot of problems. And um, the other picture that you should know will, will come later. Uh, uh, that this is in, in the, in the, in the, from the 1900s to about 1960s, agriculture production as a whole was about 30, 40% of the na national GDP in Australia. And, and then it just plummeted you know, with mining and other things, it's plummeted. So agriculture is now only 2% of the GDP. That is important. That, and then here you have a picture of um, environment the government were constructing structures to manage, help the environment. In other words, earlier the construction of structures for extracting water from the river, now they're trying to do things, put the water back, and that requires construction, and that is now taking off like hell. Okay, so, so the question is, in all these pictures you can see here, you know, for a period of time, everything was going up. Everything was following, so water use, irrigation area, Population, everything was going up and up and up. And then some point in time, it just turned around, came down. The 
question is why. And, 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 and secondly, uh, from a modeling perspective, can we model it? That's the question. So, so I mentioned to you about the four eras. So you can sort of give a feeling that 1900 to 1945, development and expansion of downstream settlement and very little migration. So basically, people started at the, at the end, the downstream end, and they had no other support. There's no dams, and they just use whatever they can to get extract water and irrigate. But then uh, the cre they created wealth from that, and the wealth then was used to introduce technology, including dams. And, so, and then that opened up areas for irrigation and water, and then people started following that. So there was a migration of people so further expansion from the downstream to the middle stream and, and further up, so migration. And, and then 1917 to 1990, as more and more water was taken out of the river, there was a gradual appearance of environmental problems. An example is salinity, for example. Salinization was starting to be a major problem. And then by 1990, we, and, and afterwards, this problem get worse and worse, and they were of course, people tried all kinds of Band-Aid type solutions to solve this problem, but really, it was not really for solving the problem in a fundamental way. And, and finally, and, and so gradually, with all these environmental problems, there was a natural awareness of environment, environment in the community. And then, and there was a huge drought that lasted about 10 years. It sort of focused everybody's attention. And with the drought, with the green lobby becoming very powerful and influential, and the fact that by that time, agriculture was just barely 2% of the GDP, and the government was wealthy, and they could use the money and intervene and started you know, buying back the water rights from farmers who are willing to sell, who cannot compete in the environment, and gradually, everything was taken back, and that was the one that triggered the pendulum. So in other words, people started leaving because they were selling their water rights to government or selling it back to people in the downstream area. People doing other, so for example, rice farmers in the upstream area sold their water rights to horticulturalists in the downstream area and then just, and they left. And then the population went down. This is what we call a pendulum swing, okay? So on the one hand, there was this dynamics that I showed you in the time, in all the, the figures that I showed you before. So here's an example of um, the rice farmer, rice growers in the upstream sold the annual allocations to people, horticulturists in the downstream area, so they can just give the water away and move away from the landscape and, and, the, and, the, and the, the landscape became available back to environment. And I spoke to the manager of New South Wales State Water, I mean, Chan is a young, engineer, barely 35 years old, he's in charge of the entire water resources of the state. So I, I spoke to him and I, I asked him, okay, you are the manager, who's your main customer? This is 2011. And he said, environment is my customer. 90% of the work that I do, day to day, is dealing with the environment. So, so that is where it has come to in this state, that a state that has been using this water for agriculture for 100 years, now the manager tells me that 90% of the water of the work that he does is to care for the environment. So that is the, that, the, that's where the situation. And another thing I want to say, I, I talked to you about pendulum swing. Also, what happened was that, you know, this is a cartoon. So irrigation started at the downstream end, and people followed the water, people for the dam, and so people were moving upstream. And by the nine, by 1980, they have co come to the end, the end of the catchment, and then by, nine, by 2000, they started moving back. So this is a migration, not only in time, but also in space, up and, up and down. So it's kind of a dynamics. The question is, we roughly know why it's happening, but the question is, can we model it? Can we mimic it? Can we learn something from the modeling that can, we can apply to other places? Because you, know, you can always mimic one place as, as much as you like. The question is, can we learn something from it and apply it to some other place or some other circumstance? So that is the, the motivation. So that is the question. Can we mimic what we call an emergent dynamics? A dynamic that happened as a result of humans and nature, humans and water interacting together over a 100-year period. 
a dynamics that emerged can we model it using a couple human system, human water system model. So that is the challenge. And the, the idea is not to model it in a way that we can predict, but to model it to gain understanding. That, that is the way I approach it at the moment. And so the model I'm going to present to you it ha has a childlike simplicity to it. I mean, I'm using this, this as a toy model. I'm not claiming that it is all perfect. In fact, it's far from perfect. And some of the social scientists here will, will be horrified by what I'm going to sh show you. But, but for me, as a hydrologist, uh, I have to go through this thing. I have to go through this, and I have to use that, communicate that, interact with other social scientists and uh, hydrologists, and, and, and refine my thinking and refine my model so that this kind of approach can be used, adopted for other circumstances as well. OK. Now, this is a picture put together by a student that I'm co-advising at the University of Western Australia. I, I won't go through the entire detail. But if you really want to do it, you can go to this level of complexity. Lots of circles and, and, and boxes, because there's hydrology here, water balance model. There's the land use model, how you use the landscape, how you allocate the land to irrigation, ag agriculture, and so on. And um, there's a population model, how population dynamics, and ecosystem components, economics, community sensitivity is something that I'm going to talk about. So if you really want to see it as complex as all of it, you could. You can put together a very, very complex model. And there are models like this available. But you know, it's very hard to put your hang, head around it. And, and I, one of the things that I want to do is actually distill it down to something more simple. Because almost like down to the level of a toy model, that I can begin to understand and fund, un, 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 in a fundamental, fundamental level. So this is what I'm going to try and do. So before I present to you the, the, the full model, even though it's simple, I'm going to give you sort of some basic ideas. So, so we, have the, we have water, we have the land, we have the human. So these are the resources that we have in the system. These three together, combining together, water, land, and humans, they create wealth. So when they produce something, they create wealth. And the wealth contributes to it. When become, people become wealthy, they invest that wealth to, into what I generally call technology. So you, if you are a farmer using you know, your hand to plow and so on, maybe with the wealth you can, create a, you can buy a tractor and, 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 and do all kinds of things. Technology always goes up. And, and so, so the wealth leads to technology. Technology keeps improving. And when the technology goes up and people see potential to create wealth, with the technology and the land and the resources, it attracts people. So when there's no people before, with all these things, they are, they, it creates an attraction, and people move towards that attraction, and so people migrate. And pe so that leads to attractiveness, that goes back to this, and then goes back around again. So you use the technology, use the people to harvest more water and harvest more land, and it goes round and round. So it's a continuous growth cycle that keep going. This is what was happening for the last 80 years or so, before, well, before about 1990. So that's what I'm saying here. Water, land, humans, generational wealth, because it produces something, well contributes to technology, and then that technology allows you to harvest more water, put more area under irrigation, increase the crop productivity, and all of that creates wealth, and leads you to makes it attractive, and people migrate from outside, or people migrate internally from one place to another place where there's attractiveness. So this continues up like that. But the opposite side is that the more you do this, the more you extract water from the, from the environment, from the river, less and less water in the system. So, so all of that leads to damage to the environment in a broad sense. So it could be salinity, it could be uh, no water enough, not, not enough water for the wetlands that we have in this place, and the birds don't come away, come here, and you know, all the way down to the Southern Ocean, there's no flow anymore. All these things are bad, and so it damages to the environment. That 
leads to general environmental awareness in the community, green lobby, or you know, people get really concerned about the environment that they live in, not only in this basin, even from outside, even outside, you know, the external influences. And that triggers government to, government to come in, intervene, and they impact on what people do, buy back the water rights, and that's the opposite side. That, that's control of the opposite side, and that's what I'm describing here. Water extraction for irrigation leads to reduced river flows, leads to, to degradation, and salinization is an example of that. And then that leads to an awareness, and that creates a pressure on the government to act, which it did. They put something like $10 billion to fix the problem. And, and, and really, the fact that only a fraction now, uh, the agriculture only contributes a fraction, 2%, to the national economy, is also a blessing in disguise to the government because they, can, they don't have to worry about the farmers so much because they're only 2% of the economy. So they can do that. So these are the two opposing dynamics that are driving the system, and the question is how can you model it? So what I'm going to present to you is a, um, a modeling framework, um, uh, which includes five coupled differential equations. Only one is hydrology. All the rest is human. Even the hydrology is so simple. So in other words, from what I'm saying here, that as a, as a hydrologist, I'm horrified that I'm not so important. You know, in, in, even to describe the hydrology over the 100 year time frame, my role is limited, I've only, 5%, uh, only 20%, because I'm only one of five equations, because all the other four are important. So this is just to describe the hydrology. And so we have an equation for hydrology or, or storage, actually say, equation for population growth, irrigation area per capita, ecology, which is kind of described the amount of flow that's allowed to go into the wetlands. And then we even, as I told you, somebody with some of you today, we even have an equation for environmental awareness. You might say, how do you do that? You know, uh, it's really the uh, awareness, by awareness we are talking about memory, memory bank. So a, you, you can always understand a memory bank, you can put money in the bank and take out, make money out of the bank. So that's a kind of a bucket model. So we are using that kind of an approach to do memory. In other words, memory of environmental degradation. You know, and, and we are, because we need to do that, because that's the only way that we can bring in the environmental uh, aspect into this. OK. The model that we are using is, is distributed. So basically what we did is divided this, this stretch of the river into three parts. Upstream, middle stream, and downstream. So the five equations that I'm going to talk about are applied to each of these three different streams or parts of the basin. And of course, they are coupled down, you know, one, one basin is coupled to the basin downstream, and so on. So, so, so the five equations for each segment of the stream, and then they are coupled to the downstream section as well. OK? Um, so of course, when you, whenever you have a model, you need initial conditions. And uh, so, so we are starting with almost pristine condition, going back 100 years. And we start with 5,000 people living in the downstream area. That's the population that, that we, we include here at the beginning. And the rest of the streams are pristine, no people. And uh, yeah, middle stream, upstream are, remain undeveloped at that time. That's the initial condition. Sorry, oh, sorry. Did I get that right? Yeah. Yeah, OK. OK. And then, so you need an initial condition, and you need also boundary conditions. The only boundary conditions that we have for this, for this model is uh, commodity prices or, or food price. So because that's an economic external, externality that, that drives what people do. So that, that's, uh, we managed to get this information from somewhere. So crop price as a function of time over the last 100 years. So in fact, you can see prices stable here and then skyrocketed after the 1970s for many reasons, actually. And then this is an example of the other uh, boundary condition, which is the flow coming in from the upstream. From, remember, Waga, at Wagga Wagga, that's the main input to the, the system. Of course, there is also rain. I'm, I don't put it in there, but rain is also involved. But the main input is flow coming in from the upstream and, and this is an example of the time series 
over the 100 years. I just want you to also uh, look at this, this part of the, the picture here. This is the period we, during which we had the drought. So we had the, this long drought, which is now recently broken by major flood that happened in New South Wales. So uh, this, this has, will, have, will have some impact on the memory, that when there's a drought, they remember and they worry about it, and, the, and then floods came, and they started forgetting already. It's actually already not happening. OK, so equations. I'm going to go over these equations in more detail later. But so we have an equation for irrigation area per capita. That's one equation. We have an equation for human population. Equation for, I'm going to explain this. So equation for ecology, an equation for hydrology, which is really the storage in the system. And we have an equation for the environmental awareness. So in, you can think of this as the epsilon is the memory, and memory is a storage, is a bank. You've stored the memory, and memory can be added. So if there's repeated floods or whatever problems, memory gets built up, and then there's no, no droughts, and then so memory gets depleted. So uh, that's the way that we do this here. OK. So let's go over this. Uh, you know, again, I think uh, be careful that this is, a, I consider this as a still a toy model. I'm going to make, we are making a lot of assumptions. We are picking numbers from the air just to continue. Uh, and and uh, because to actually quantify these properly requires a lot of empirical work, going out and data collection and all that. We haven't actually done all that. This modeling will help us decide what to measure, what to, what to measure, and what to collect, and so on. So the modeling is useful exercise from that perspective. But, but so far, is, except for the, the crop price and the flow data, everything else is artificial, meaning we, we just created things so that we can mimic the dynamics. So this equation covers the, the RA, which is the area per capita, so per person. So that might grow in time. You know, that either because of technology, so that if the technology, you know, you create wealth, the techno that technology allows you to grow more area. So that can contribute to the growth of irrigation area per capita. Same thing with storage improvement. In other words, as more and more water storage is available, when, when the dam is built, that means the water is available, the farmers feel comfortable that they, okay, they can go out and grab more area to irrigate because they, they know that the water is there. So that contributes to your growth. And, and then, Later on, uh, when environment kicks in, when the environment problems kick in and there's a correction that, that because of the environment, they begin to control themselves or they, they reduce their area under irrigation. That's also coming in later. That's, so this is, these are the two, three components of the growth dynamics of irrigation area. So, so remember, the, I, I told you about the two, three terms, alpha tau and alpha s and alpha epsilon. Here are some, here are some examples how, for example, the technology improvement you know, per year, how is a function of technology? As technology increases, alpha increases. And so that's the, the relationship that we are using now. Don't ask me where we got it. We, we just used it so that we actually mimic the data. We mimic the final dynamics. Now, I haven't introduced technology yet. I'll come back to that later. So I have an expression for technology that, based on wealth, we'll introduce later. Here is a correction for the storage. So more water for available. That, that contributes to a growth in the irrigation area. And environmental awareness leads to a reduction. So this is a negative number. So these are the three things that contribute to that dynamics. Now we talk about population. Um, so human population, number, number of people, has a natural growth rate, you know, natural reproduction, which is we assumed as a constant. And then we have, when the place becomes attractive, there's so more area available, people come from outside. So migrate from outside, and that leads to an increase. That's the attractiveness index. And then there's a relocation rate between settlements. So they're from downstream to middle stream, middle stream to upstream. As the middle stream is more attractive than the downstream, then we, they move up. Okay? And we define attractiveness here in a simple way. So they say, a max, which is the potential area that is available, the maximum that's possible. A i is the actual area under irrigation. 
So the difference is the area that is not under irrigation that's available divided by the population. So that means that people outside see that there's land, and that is an attractive thing, they move in. So that, that brings in people from outside. That's an attractive reason. And then there's an um, influx of you know, people coming from outside. Uh, sorry, what did I say? Yeah, yeah sorry, attractiveness, yeah. So, so we then create, so for people coming from outside, we created a, a, a factor psi, which is a function of the attractiveness. So the high attractiveness means people coming from outside, low attractiveness people leave the basin. So we have this function that relates the psi to phi, attractiveness, and then so we assume some kind of a function like this uh, to quantify this. So that's, that's the index that we are using. Likewise, um, uh, we also have people moving from downstream to middle stream to middle, from middle stream to upstream. There, what you do is do a comparative analysis. So the difference between the attractiveness here and the attractiveness there, that triggers the motion. That's almost like a gradient. Gradient in attractiveness that gets people to move from downstream to upstream, from middle stream to middle stream to upstream, and so on. And then when the environment kicks in, then we, we have introduced a correction factor, which forces people to move downstream from Upstream, upstream to middle stream, middle stream to downstream, so everything goes back. We actually force that, and, and because that, we are not trying to capture exactly what happened, because exactly what happened is very complicated, but we are doing it in a simple, simple minded way. Okay, and then we have the hydrology. Um, so the hydrology is relatively simple. So you have, a, a, for every stream, you have flow coming in from the upstream, flow going out to the downstream. And then in the middle, there's, there could be local rainfall. And so the rainfall multiplies the, uh, some kind of runoff coefficient times the area that gives you the amount of new water coming in from rainfall. And then we have water taken out for irrigation. Okay, so we take the water from the storage and use it for irrigation. So this IC here is the irrigation demand. And I will explain to you how that I calculate that later. Irrigation demand is the, uh, the area under cultivation multiplied by the water use for each crop. So that demand, minus if it is raining, of course, we don't have to use that water, so we subtract that. So that's the kind of water balance equation. Irrigation demand, I mentioned, is equal to the amount of water that you used, used for a crop, multiplied by the area. So this is the water used for per, per area, per, per square meter or something, and multiplied by the irrigated area, that gives you the total amount of demand, total demand. So, so that goes in here, this, this area. So you can see here, every all, I'll show you later that all these equations are all coupled. So you're, you're using an area under irrigation. But that's part of the, one of the governing equations. So they are all coupled. And so you, you, you use this equation to monitor the storage in the system. And, and then we also look at um, the demand for water and the amount of water available, and look, they look at the difference. And if, if we have the deficit, if you have a deficit, and if the deficit repeats itself year after year after year, that's a sign that there, is need, there, needs, there needs to be storage, that there's not enough water in storage. So that's a sign that we need to build a reservoir. So we use that deficit, and we accumulate the deficit, and when the decu deficit accumulates to a certain number, we say, oh, that means the community will build a reservoir to store more water. And that's the way, so we, build, we start with nothing, or a small reservoir, eventually increase the capacity more and more, just triggered by this indicator that goes underneath and tells you that it'll be nice time to build another reservoir. Now, I told you about uh, technology last time. I didn't define it very well. So technology, in, in general, you know, it means many things. Um, technology, we make it as a function of the agricultural gr growth based in product, or GBP. And technology can be increased mechanization, increased water use efficiency, increased delivery of water, or a number of different things. We just put them all into one common category as techno technology. And we make that technology as a function of wealth. And we calculate wealth, GBP, as a function of the amount of crop produced. So crop yield for, per area, Multiply by the irrigation area. Yeah? This is the amount of crop that comes in. 
multiply by the core price. I gave you the price at the beginning. So we multiply the price. That's the amount of wealth generated in the system. And you divide by the population. So per capita, GBP. And the technology here, here you can see here, is a function of, of that GBP. And uh, sorry, I, I, haven't, I, I think that comes later. So, so here you have uh, how the crop demand uh, uh, gamma uh, S decreases with increased technology because you know, we can be much more, more and more efficient with water use. And on the other hand, crop yield with increased crop breeding and so on can increase with technology. So all, all that are, are part of technology. And here you have the relationship that I promised to do, say, present to you. This is the gross basin product and technology. We assume this kind of a function. The technology goes up and then kind of stabilizes. It doesn't grow as fast as it did early in the century. So these are some of the inputs that we assumed to build the model. And then finally, or not finally, the, the ecology. So for simplicity, what we assumed is there are a bunch of wetlands at the downstream end of the basin, because um, uh, wetlands are everywhere, but we just chose to put them downstream of the outlet somewhere here, and, and we modeled the wetlands. So we have these wetlands are kind of water storages, and they are only filled whenever the flow is, reaches a high level. So we actually put a threshold. Whenever the water flow or water level is higher than the threshold, that water goes into the wetland and fills up the wetlands. And then, and then you wait for another, next time the flows go up. So it's only the fit, wetlands are filled only periodically or, or episodically. And um, so we put that water in the bucket, and then we, the bucket then loses some water through leakage or evaporation. And uh, so it's a simple kind of bucket model. Just keeps the wetlands in part of, as part of the picture. We are the, and driven by only the main, the high flows that are infrequent, but they do happen, and that's the way we handle it. Okay. Um, I think I've already said that. So this is, uh, yeah, this is what if you say here. So the wetland water storage is equal to water comes in, minus water goes out but through leakage, and, and when the water level is higher than some threshold, then the water will overflow. Otherwise, it will just leak. That's all. Simple model. And finally, this thing called awareness. So it's, it's almost like, a, as I said, a, a memory bank. So um, uh, DDT, the memory uh, of environmental awareness, is equal to lambda. Lambda can accumulate or deplete. So it can, be, it can mean that accumulation, or, or it can deplete. It accru accumulates when there is a drought. So in other words, for, for example here, we set a, uh, for the wetlands, we set a threshold, and uh, so called the degradation threshold, and when we, and we count the number of days that this wetland uh, is, 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 uh, uh, is below the threshold, number of days continuously, and that gives you a sign uh, of the of the uh, of the of the um, de degradation that's happening, and on the on the basis of that, uh, if, if if this repeats itself year after year after year, the memory accumulates because th things are getting worse. And but then if it is then flooded, and and so the wetland fills up, and then then we actually deplete the memory. So this this way we can sort of maintain and monitor the environmental awareness over time. So. That is what we are using, and this is an example of uh, kind of the lambda that we use uh, as a function of what we call water shortage days. How many days there is a shortage in the, in the system uh, for filling the reservoir, so it, it accumulates and then depletes. Okay? So this is the awareness uh, equation. Okay. I think this picture is very confusing, but I think the, the main point, I think we are still trying to sort of Organize it in a way that easy to follow, but the most important thing that you should take from this is that we have one, two, three, four, and five systems with state variables in each of them, uh, with, with using differential equations to follow their dynamics. But they are all in connected, coupled together in complex ways, um, and so we, we are solving a highly coupled, nonlinear system. 
in this way. And, uh, and, and, the, and the question is, um, we use this sort of couple model with the kind of assumption that we made and the parameterization we arbitrarily assumed, and of course calibrated, to see whether we can actually mimic the dynamics that actually, the empirical dynamics that I presented at the beginning. Can we mimic it? And because by mimicking it, we can gain some insights into what is controlling the dynamics and what do we need to understand and model or, and measure in the future. So, so I'm going to give you some results. So two, two slides. So here you have, I, don't, I hope that you can read this. Um, this is the crop price. Remember, I assumed crop price goes up like this. Now here you have number of internal variables. For example, this is the environmental awareness, the memory, the epsilon that I talked about. So there was nothing up to here. There was no problem. All the wetlands were being flooded well. And then from the 1940s and so on, you know, it started accumulating. In other words, people, the memory or the awareness of the environment was accumulating, and it hit a peak during that big drought in the 1990s. Here you have the technology how it developed, and of course, you know, technology was not so, not growing fast, and then by the, by the 1960s, 1980s, just really skyrocketed and reached a plateau here. And here you have the, uh, uh, population variation, sorry. So this is uh, how the population changed. So different colors represent population, human population in different parts of the stream. And uh, blue in the downstream, middle, middle stream is red, and upstream is black. So you can see here, this, this, this picture tells you that um, gradually people were migrating, initially migrating upward, and then later they were migrating downward. Okay? And, I, and another picture will show you this. So I, I presented you the data earlier. This is the, the observed dynamics. And here I have four pictures that sort of give you some insights. So this is the reservoir construction, so res uh, uh, reservoir storage. So you started with the storage construction here, and then stable, this is in the downstream area, and there was another one constructed up, and then there was a middle stream construction. So the, 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 it sort of mimics the idea that reservoirs themselves are moving upstream over time. And uh, here you have the irrigation uh, area under irrigation, and is going, and, and then now it, it's swinging around, just like it swung around in the, in the real world. So it's coming around. This is the human population went up and down. And this is the wetland water storage. You can see here, wetland water storage is above the threshold for most of the time until the 1980s and 90s when it started plummeting, and that contributed to the environmental awareness and memory, and then that, that contributed to the downstream. So that's also being mimicked really well. So, so, what ha so, so let, me, let me repeat what happened from the empirical side and what we were able to mimic using the model. So we had started with water, land, and humans. They created wealth that contributed to technology advancement. Technology contributed to more resource extraction, growth of the system. Everything was growing. And except that more and more extraction of the resource, water and land, contributed to environmental degradation. And initially, this environmental degradation was attempted to be solved by simple band-aid solutions. But eventually, none of that worked. And, and then we had this compounding effect of the severe drought that happened. It brought everything together. And that contributed to community awareness, significant community awareness, and that led to community outcry. That contributed to government intervention, including in terms of buying back water rights, and forced farmers to begin to trade upstream, downstream, so, um, because they could use the water, so they could use that government subsidy to give back their water rights and move away. And, and that lead to population swing of, uh, of swing, the pendulum swing of population exodus. They, people started leaving. They sold their water rights, sold their land, 
and, and started leaving the place. And, uh, and then eventually, government and people started investing in the environment that begins, begins to contribute to the recovery. In fact, I, I, I was in, when I was talking to the manager, and one of the things that he told me struck me really, really well. And I, he said, what will happen? I said, take out your crystal, crystal ball. Tell me what this place will look like in 50 years. And it was remarkable what he said, that he sees this thing to accelerate. And in 50 years, number of towns, major towns in New South Wales, in this Murray Darling River Basin, will disappear from the map. There will be no towns left. They will be just leaving because of what we were experiencing, because of this kind of dynamics, this kind of drive. People will just, communities will hold, completely you know, leave, towns will disappear, industries will change, everything. So this is the kind of dynamics that happened, and we are kind of in a crude way mimicking that, and, and that gives us interesting insights into what happened. So coming back to the model, so model captures the basic features of the pendulum swing. But of course, we have to wonder, with a toy model like this, is the model right? <laughs> is it predicting well for the right reasons, or are we just artificially mimicking something? Is it the right model? And you already saw that I used arbitrarily a lot of constitutive relationships to build the model and run the model, and a lot of parameters. Some of them can be easily acquired. In fact, I'm going to, in the next phase of my work, going to the Sydney Water State Authority. They have a lot of information. Uh, prices, area, a lot of information they are prepared to give me. So I'm going to go and, and use that data to, to f finalize, streamline some of the constitutive relations, not, not, but not all of them. So, um, so this kind of data analysis on the economics and the demographics, we can get. And we can, we can sort of uh, improve the model from that way. But there's one thing fundamental. In other words, if we can always mimic in one place, but the challenge is, can the, can the model be generic enough that we can apply that model to some other place without all these data being available? Without, you know, can we extrapolate? That is a challenge, and if you want to do that, then we really have to look at, just like in hydrology, also in this case, understand human actions. What are the motivations for human actions? How do we, mo how do we measure or model changing community attitudes? For example, in this case, for 80 years, there was no, no awareness, no focus on the environment. They didn't, nobody cared about the environment. They just cared about the wealth that they, that they could make out of this. And, and then, as the environment hit back, and attitudes began to change. But how do we know that at, in 1910 when the project started? How, do we, how could we have predicted that, that this will happen? Or something else will happen? That kind of futuristic thing. That, requires for us to go back to understand human actions in a fundamental way. And I think that is not, not something that I can do. I, I don't have any expertise, so I think we need to talk to people who actually are specialists in this and learn something from it. And, uh, and the final thought is, yeah, this is nice, one, more, one place, one model, but are, we, are there fundamental principles that apply everywhere that can be the basis for, for future models? This is something that we need to do, and I'm at on time. Oh, sorry. Um, we need to uh, do. Uh, do uh, I'm, I'm almost done. Sorry. So I, I, I might finish this because this is a uh, summary, uh, sort of a, extra, a, a, a uh, distillation of that complex model that I presented to you. This is a, something that my folk student in Australia put together, and she, she really has put it really, very, very nicely. So we have the way I presented. There are two loops: the environmental, ec the economic population loop that I talked about at the beginning, and then there's community sensitivity loop. They go, one is going the other one way, the other one is going the other way, they are competing against each other that co and contributing to the dynamics that you saw. <coughs> so this could be the basis a, a generic, uh, for a generic model, and community sen sensitivity is affected by all of these things. Climate, socioeconomic regime, political regime, all of these things, how do they impact on community sensitivity? What can we learn? How can we actually observe this and, and then put them into equations? This is something that if social ideology is going to go anywhere, we have to work here. Because this is easy, but this is hard. 
So, so you've heard about hydrology and social hydrology, so I just used the circles that I had. This is hydrology. Okay, you have all these things, but we focus on this, and everything is prescribed. Eco-hydrology is, you, you still have all these things, but ecology and hydrology interact together there. And integrated water resource management, you have all of these things, but then this is prescribed or this is not even there. And everything is interacting. And social hydrology, that's the missing link. That, that is what we are trying to include, include here. This is the thing that separates social hydrology from everything else. And I want to finish with this uh, slide. All this work that we are doing in, under social hydrology is actually contributing to this new initiative, new decadal initiative of the IHS, Kantarai. So I think that those of you who are, have any interest in change in hydrology and society, I think you should, you should uh, make an effort to contribute and participate in this thing and just like we are also doing. Thank you very much. I'm slightly over time. Sorry. Thanks, Steva. Time for questions. Students in class. Ali. Thanks, Steva, for a uh, very inspiring talk. Uh, it was great, and uh, thanks for coming to Saskatchewan as well. Uh, one point that I'm actually wondering in your model, the model is fantastic uh, mechanistic view of how human ecology, hydrology, link together and couple together. But there is one important issue in behavior of human and any kind of biological system, and that is Sorry, uh, any yeah. other biological system, and that is self-organizing. Self-organization. Yeah, so basically, uh, you know, for instance, the, the relationship that you have uh, between all these subcomponents uh, of this uh, system might change, especially during the extreme condition or any catastrophe happen. And there is also another issue that uh, we have these parameters, for instance, the technology change and the response of human to technology change might be completely changing in time and also might be completely nonlinear. For instance, in yeah. Europe, awareness about, I mean, the technology brought the awareness about, uh, for instance, uh, you know, less use uh, mitigation of like the human use of water. Yeah. Whereas, for instance, in the United States, for instance, in Phoenix, that path is coming from is like people have more money and then they start like moving. Um, putting more water onto their garden. Mm -hmm. So basically the water use increases. So how we can actually incorporate all of this mm -hmm. nonlinearity, heterogeneity in human behavior and also self-organizing yeah. into such a system dynamic approach that is actually completely conceptual and mechanistic. So basically inherently doesn't allow for such a thing. Uh, yeah. I would appreciate if you actually share your thought on that. Well, that's a very difficult question. So, um, I, um, I mean, some of the the feedback that I, I, I had in the equation, uh, for example, humans creating wealth, then, then going out and harvesting, and, and then that's coming back. That's already a complex system. That can, on, on its own, lead to self-organization. So in other words, even within the you know, equations that I presented, there's the potential for uh, emergent dynamics to come out, as simple as that, simple as the fact that they are a couple nonlinear differential equations. So, so so I'm hoping that the way to address some of these questions that you're, both, you're talking about is to, to understand these systems of equations that are presented as complex systems and see what kind of emergent properties that they produce, emergent dynamics that they produce by themselves. And uh, not, not prescribing that, in other words, you, know, you talk about self-organization. Self-organization must come out of the equation rather than you, you don't put it in. So that's the way I would uh, do it, but I think we are, we are still early days in that. I mean, I think I, I really don't want, don't want to complicate this too much at the moment. It's so, it's, you know, even this is already too complex, even though it's very simple. You know, on the one hand, it's so simple, but on the other hand, there's a lot of complexity. In fact, when I presented this last, uh, in a workshop that we, I organized in Champagne, the people in the audience who are specialists in complex systems and nonlinear dynamics, then they said, oh my God, this is a lot of interesting dynamics that is going to, you're not even studying them. So, so the question is, where, where do I put my eggs? You know, where do I put my effort? So I, I decided that I will do it. My, my role is to sort of organize this in such a way that at least we can talk in terms of equations. I can communicate to other people in terms of equations rather than just talk in general terms. So this is where we are. We are at the very early stage, very foundational stage, that we are trying to 
you know, um, define these things in a way that you can communicate. You know, not, we need to have a language to communicate, and, and especially to uh, mathematicians and hydrologists and so on. They understand these equations easy, and so I'm trying to develop that. But at the same time, I'm trying to use the equation to communicate to social scientists and say, my god, I'm grappling with all these questions. I need the numbers, and where do I get these numbers, and where do I get these relationships? And so it, it might trigger more discussion and more inputs. And so this is the way I'm doing it. OK? All right. Yeah. So yeah, Andrew. Yeah. Um, so it's quite hard as a hydrologist to think how some of these um, things like memory are, f are feeding into a hydrological water balance equation. Um, so ha what are the units of your, of your measurement of memory? And how do you convert that into? There's no unit. Sorry? No unit. It's, it's, a, it's an index. So, but, but somehow you've got to, you've got to measure memory in, in terms of some kind of hydrological. Well, I think the memory, in this case, we actually made it a function of this lambda factor, which is a factor which is a function of the number of days that the water level in the, in the wetland was below a threshold. Mm -hmm. So if, if you like, that unit could be the number of, that number of days thing. So, but I think we haven't, I mean, there are other people that I, I'm working with who model the memory as non-dimensional numbers, so they don't have to deal with the egg. So uh, you, can, you can never get away from it. I mean, you have to define it some ways. Yeah. And in this case, we kind of, I mean, there's, I don't have an answer to that. I mean, I, I already admitted that. But okay. I think we need to grapple with that. OK. Yeah. Toddy, then Howard. Yeah. Yeah, if you could, yeah. Sorry for the long walk around. <laughs> um, I'm really curious about the use of differential equations. Because that's the common denominator that allows you to link across all three, all five of the models. Yeah. And so there are certain assumptions that are embedded in the use of a differential equation. Yeah. And so I'm curious about two dimensions of that. One is, why is a differential equation the right choice? And what are the underpinning assumptions behind that that you get with a differential equation that you wouldn't get with another kind of equation? And then second, just picking up on your, your, your notion of language, is the use of differential equation a way to get all of those models basically talking to each other? Yeah. Okay, and the second, and the answer to the second question, yes, the, the um, this is the language that I, I mean, I have to say that this is this kind of thing is the language that I understand um, because it, it gives me the ability to 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 do some analysis and 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 so writing down them writing them down in in the form of differential equations uh, helps them to connect to each other and and. It enabled me to enable to analyze, analyze that. So that's so, so more like, like a language, but it's quantitative. So I can do quantitative analysis, and that's that's always helpful, uh, even if they are kind of fuzzy, as I mentioned to Andrew. You know, yeah, what is memory? You know, I, I, what, how, what do I, how do I describe it? It's memory, but what is memory? So you have to define that. But but we we will eventually get to that. We can eventually get that. Coming back to the first question, the, the notion of differential equation themselves. Okay, the reason that we are using, I mean, as opposed to any other equation you can think of, the, the, the use of differential equation, we are talking about dynamics. Things are more, more changing in time. So anytime some, some things are changing in time, in a, in a, in a, in a complex way, I mean, you can always specify, this is, you know, you can draw a line, x versus t, that's, so that you're prescribing a, di a, a dynamics, that's prescription. But here, the dynamics is inter internal, self-organized. So it has to come from internally. And so differential equations are a nice vehicle to capture the dynamics. It's, it's, it's that. That's all. So they, they, it's not an analytical equation that's alpha equal beta or something, because that doesn't capture the dynamics. It captures the dynamics. You have to have, uh, uh, sorry, capture dynamics. Differential equation is a nice way of doing it. Uh, and that is why we are doing it. Okay, it's just simply the dynamics. So, Siva, it's great to see you here. And um, one of the things that you've done, following on from Toddy's comment, is actually of all the lectures, you've brought together the social scientists and the physical scientists in a way that nobody else has, I think, through this lecture series. And I think um, the model that you produced is really interesting because um, of the way it provides a conceptual basis for a dialogue. Right. Uh, and, and I really applaud you for, for doing that. Um, 
having said that, I think there's lots of issues to debate in there. And um, I'll, I'll start perhaps with the thing that I'm least qualified to talk about, and that's mm -hmm. people. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I mean, even less qualified. Uh, so I, I see much more complicated dynamics around population movements. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the rural areas of Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan, mm -hmm. the prairies here produce 80% of Canada's agriculture, mm -hmm. but they're depopulating. Mm -hmm. Rural communities are decreasing. Mm -hmm. And that's really because of the technology mm -hmm. drive. And in fact, you right. have farmers that now commute from cities out to their farms. Right, right. Um, and then if I think about another part of my life living mm -hmm. in the east of England, mm -hmm. um, then uh, again, the rural agricultural population has collapsed mm -hmm. for similar reasons, technology driven. But of course, uh, other things have taken place. So people now retire there and it's a beautiful environment to live and so on. Right, right. So um, thank you for giving us the framework. And I think we can now spend a lot of time arguing, arguing. about some of the detail. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I think that that is the, the purpose of uh, my presentation. In other words, at least I have now one frame. Uh, you, you will bet. Uh, you, I can bet that next time I give this talk, somewhere else, there'll be an advance on this because I'm, I'm using these kind of presentations to keep refining my thinking, organizing my, and getting uh, insights from other people and just keep improving this because there's no other way. I mean, I don't see any other way. And, and you know, they, the other way, of course, is I get somebody to do a PhD on this and they wait for four years or five years, six years, who knows? But I just want to do this as part of a community effort, meaning I'm here as part of the community presenting this. I'm hoping that some of you will pick up on this and have enough ideas to build on it and keep moving forward. I mean, this is, so I'm, like I said at the beginning, I'm like a missionary or a traveling salesman that I'm hoping that somebody will pick up on these ideas and, and build on it. That is the, the ultimate ulterior motive of, for giving this presentation. Good. Well, we're glad you're here. And, uh, I would like to join, ask people to join uh, at Alexander's after for a beer to continue the discussion. But I think we'll end it here. And thanks, Siva, for a very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.